All right, hey guys. Um, it's like eight, nine, nine people in the audience. That's gonna get me nice and loose, which is a little dangerous. I'm gonna relax too much. Hopefully more than nine people watch this online, so I have to remember to try to calibrate a little. Um, so uh, I'm Greg, I work here at TACT, and I'm gonna share with you some of the stuff that we've doing, uh, been doing as we, we experiment with trying to share as much information as possible between the back end and the front end of our web apps. Um, I have a, a couple of goals here. Um, if you're a web developer and you've been sort of wondering, is Haskell like ready for this stuff or do I need to be working in PureScript or Elm? Um, I hope to expose you to enough stuff that you're at least interested to download Reflex and maybe try uh, Servant Reflex and Servant and see if, if, um, if the stack that I'm gonna describe is interesting to you. Maybe you can uh, be in those communities too and kind of cross pollinate. Uh, another goal, if you don't consider yourself a web developer, um, I want to convince you that it's actually really easy to spin up one of these front ends. And like, uh, if you think Cabal or Stack is an easy way to just distribute, you know, the products of your work, there's nothing compared to distributing a link to uh, to something like. Um, Maybe you're not a front end person, but you've been developing some crazy data based DSL that uses all the fancy type level stuff in GHC. Um, I want to convince you that GHC JS can almost definitely compile it. And with Reflex DOM, you can make a really nice little interface for it. And uh, yeah, you don't have to be doing any kind of front end typical stuff. Um, yes. Oh, how's that? Yes. Okay. I, I, I like it less, but it works for you. Um, okay, so uh, what ties all those goals together? Like, why do I even care about using Haskell on the front? Well, it's it's types. Like, we love types. All Haskellers love the types, and rightly so. Uh, types give us a really nice way to model our business logic, like the data itself. So. A user ID in our case is exactly one of these three things. It's either a driver's license or a passport or a token. And if it's a driver's license, we know for sure that it has some associated state data. Um, so we can say exactly what we mean for our different types of data with types, okay, of course. It's sort of a second order thing that we love about types is we can describe um, information about behavior or transformations of our data in types, so types like Maybe A, which encodes, uh, in this case, a database connection that might be null, or a dynamic T user ID, which if you're at uh, Doug Beardsley's talk, you know, this is a user ID that can be changing over time in an FRP way, and in the front end, you could pull that thing or you could push to it. Um, and we have some more like exotic types of um, modeling at the type level going on. For example, with server, we have this server T, type family, which can turn uh, an eatery API, this is like some business domain type that you have, uh, which abstractly models the API of your web app. You can turn that into a type that you can actually execute on a server or a type that you could execute uh, as, as a client to, to like get data from uh, that API. So we, we have all these really fancy tools that we've learned how to use the types and uh, you know, don't take them away. Like if we want to do front end work too, I want to like make, make things that are interactive and pretty. Uh, and it, it just hurts so much to go from Haskell and types into like JavaScript where um, if we look at a JSON representation of our user ID, this is a passport for the country, it's fine. Like the, the JSON can encode our type, but it's not very nice to program against that. We have to do all sorts of kind of string checking validation and defensive programming. And it's just much more comfortable to always be working against the original types and just use pattern matching and stuff like that. So I probably don't need to tell you that, but yeah, if possible, we'd like to be working in Haskell or PureScript or something where we have ADTs. The more of the type tooling uh, from GHC that we can carry over into our front end work, the happier we are as Hasslers. So, um, how do we do that? Or, um, oh, sorry, got out of order. Um, yeah, like to sort of go one level up, like what, what is, it, like why do we care about types exactly? And a lot of it is about uh, the dry principle. Um, so, 
don't repeat yourself principle. Um, was anyone at the servant talk this morning? Yeah. So how many times did James say, don't repeat yourself? A lot. And I'm saying it too, I'm like repeating myself. But the driving principle <laughs> is so important that it defies irony. Like it's okay to repeat yourself when you're talking about dry. It's like the one meta level above the, the actual stuff that we don't want to repeat. So bugs uh, thrive in moisture. If you're repeating something about how your types are defined uh, and you're, you're working on an active code base, of course you are, then you're gonna find bugs in the code and you're gonna fix them in one place and forget to fix it in the other place. And then there's like a mismatch in the shape of those types or things like that. The same is true with functions. If you, um, if you have a function that describes a relationship between two types, you're gonna find bugs in that. And often we, we have to um, repeat the logic of turning one type into another on the back end and the front end. So that's not dry. Um, so how can we achieve some dryness? One option um, is like we can take some of our Haskell types or our Haskell functions and we can transpile them into the more front end focused uh, functional programming language like Alan and PureScript. If you haven't seen Chris Jenkins talk, typed all the way down, he gives a really awesome overview of how you can do this with a package that you wrote called Elm Export, I think, maybe something like that. Um, so that's, that's a really promising way to try things out. And uh, another way that I'm going to describe right now, which uh, is, has some like a different set of pros and cons, it's the pure Haskell approach, where um, we're going to pull some types and functions into a shared library. And then we're going to use GHC to compile the back end, GHC JS to compile the front end, and really share everything within the same language. Okay, so uh, to get a little crunky, how do you do this? The Haskell web app drying instructions. Uh, it's, you know, separate your, your code into three loads. Whoops, there's a typo. Um, you have your back end load, uh, which is all the code that does stuff that GHC JS will not be able to compile, like database lookups or Functions that make C calls, those aren't going to be uh, available to GHCJS because they're not available to the browser. Uh, or encryption, that's usually kind of a server side thing. And then there's your front end load, that's like specifically your reflex DOM code to actually make the widgets on the page. Like you, you don't need to be compiling those on the back end. Um, asterisk. Uh, and if I have time after all, I'll sort of unpack the asterisk. Yeah, actually, sometimes you do want the back end to be able to compile reflex DOM code. And then there's the common note. This is like the main, you know, most of your code is going to appear in this organization of code that I'm talking about. And you're going to define all of your types in a common library and as many functions as you can get to compile there. And then your serving APIs. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to, like, to give myself like a concrete example to talk about, I actually wrote uh, like a small web app specifically for you folks in this talk. Um, it's called soap.io and it's a, it's a little web app for keeping track of a bunch of gift soaps that my sister-in-law made for me last Christmas. Really nice soaps. I didn't want their only purpose to be like washing me and then disappearing so they're immortalized in, in this app. Uh, question? Yeah, can you talk a little bit about what Serpent is? is that your view talk about sure, that? yeah. Um, I'll just give a really brief description and then um, I'll refer you to like some more talks online. Um, Servant is a library that um, defines some types which you use as operators to compose together a description of an API for your web app. Um, like an abstract description. So maybe your app has two endpoints, one for reading all of the uh, users in the database and the other for finding the user that's tallest in the database or something. Um, the combinators in the servant library let you express the fact that there are those two endpoints and they have those two return values. And if there are any query parameters involved in doing that, then that's described there too. Um, the fact that those things are at the type level um, means that you can use uh, different interpretations of that type level DSL to to transform the abstract API type into concrete types, which are suitable for like uh, expressing a server or expressing a, a web client. Um, so that's that's the gist of it. And then the mechanics of it are uh, you know more involved. Yeah. Okay, so soap.io. Let me. I'll just like walk you through this. These are different sizes. Thank <laughs> you. 
Here it is. I'm not a designer, uh, but this is the idea. Um, we've got uh, a database that is holding some descriptions of soaps that I've got, and uh, they have names, they have IDs, they have, sorry, there's no header on this table, but they have durabilities, and uh, they have a URL for the, the image of the soap. And so this is a reflex DOM front end, and we can we can click around to see the different soaps. So that's fine. And so far, it's, it's kind of just like CRUD operations. Like we can delete these, and uh, there's a form for adding new ones. Actually, there we go. We add a new one. But then, like this other property that soaps have in my databases, I don't want to remember their names. Like I might want to look one up by color. So I have um, an endpoint that, uh, given a pixel location and a soap, uh, can tell me the color around that pixel. And uh, so if I click a couple times, I can choose a couple sample colors from the soap, and you see they they come over here too. You know, there's there's other data in that soap type for checking the colors. Whatever, that's cute. And then there's also a soap size optimizer in this library. So um, different soaps have different durabilities and um, maybe my shower, you know, shower lengths tend to be like shorter or longer and I have less or more budgetary constraints. And different soaps cost like different amounts of money and it's just like hard to get them to be certain aspect ratios. So part of my business logic is like I can take a shower length and a budgetary constraint and a soap durability and I can compute like an optimal size of soap that I should buy. I'm just gonna go buy like bars and bars of this type of soap. Okay, so obviously a ridiculous example, but it has a few crowd endpoints and a few non-crowd endpoints to sort of demonstrate, uh, you know, the, the techniques that we can use here. Okay. So, uh, sharing the objects. This is probably the, the, the easiest part. Um, so uh, we have our common library in source directory. There's a module soap, and here's our definition of a soap. So a particular soap has a name, a durability, a uh, text URL, and uh, a couple of colors, and that's, that's all fine. So now um, on the front end, how are we gonna deal with soaps? Like I showed you a form where I can construct new soaps and insert them into the database. And um, here's where uh, sharing the types between the front end and, and the back end is sort of helpful. Like if we were using JavaScript, we'd probably have a lowercase soap object and we might like just add fields to that until we have all of the fields that soap is supposed to have. But we wouldn't necessarily have any guarantees that all those fields are there. Maybe if we spelled one wrong, then it wouldn't be, or you know, we might have to like talk about default values for the field or something. But when we're using Haskell, we, a, a SOAP is a very concrete thing. And um, so what I'm demonstrating here is like how we can use uh, Reflex DOM to build up a really concise way to make a form to talk about new SOAPs. So uh, we have um, a little bit of a complication though, like Doug was talking about uh, the maybe-ness property, I think he called it. Um, the form might not always have valid values. Like we might not always be able to build a soap if the form doesn't validate. And the, the subparts of a soap, like the name and the durability, each subpart might not be valid right now. So um, what we've done in front end slash source slash main is we just made a little utility type here, which is functor composing the dynamic functor with the either text functor. And then uh, we make a little validating input reflex DOM widget, which is more lines than I wanted to put on the slide, but if you're curious about how you make such a widget, it's about 10 lines, and I can show you the code later if you're interested. I have it all pulled up here. All right, so um, a valid input widget uh, takes some validating function, that's a pure function, from text to either text or the thing that you're building, and it returns uh, this dynamic V of that thing that you're trying to build. And then we can use that three times, and uh, we're gonna build up those three fields, a uh, name field, a durability field, and URL field, each with the custom validators for those types. And then we can just use the applicative instance to compose those together and make our dynamic, maybe, a soap. 
Okay. Uh, sharing functions. This is something that I think is a little bit harder to do uh, when you're transpiling into Elm. I think it's easier to share types than functions. Is that true? It seems like it should be. Um, but we can get some mileage out of this too. This is something that we want to do. So for example, optimal soap size, that soap size optimizer I was telling you about. Um, do we want that to run on the back end or the front end? Both, yeah, maybe. I'm, the way that I set it up here is that as you're dragging these things around, you see the output says estimate. So the front end is using a version of that optimizer that's kind of imprecise and goes really fast. And then when you let go of the sliders, we're calling a, a backend endpoint that uses a really high precision, like extreme high resolution optimizer to get like a damn exact perfect size of soap that, that you should buy, you know, really anal about your soap sizes. So sometimes you might think that uh, an endpoint is for the backend, but you sort of open yourself up to happy accidents if you uh, can compile those in a way that's agnostic to whether you're using GHC or GHCJS. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Here, you can see the optimal soap size. It's some ridiculous, silly cost function about the, the width and the height of the soap and your, the soap's duration and your budgetary constraints. Whatever, it's a totally made up example. Uh, so um, that brings me to the uh, sales pitch part of the talk. Um, we can also share APIs between the front end and the back end. And if, if you've done some web development and you're thinking about dryness, one of the things that probably comes to mind is like there's sort of some like accidental non-dryness in your API itself. Like if the back end changes like how many query parameters or what order the captures are supposed to be in, that's something that's really hard to check that you've gotten right when you're just writing XHR requests by hand. Um, so the natural thing that you want to do here is to derive those from your certain spec. If you have a certain spec that's already driving your server, you can use um, a library that I've been working on with Doug Beersley and a couple other people. Uh, to drive query functions that match the FRP semantics of reflex DOM. And then you can, you can have the same type level guarantees that you're calling your API in the right way using the widgets and the dynamic values that you have floating around in front of it. All right, so um, here's uh, the sub API for the soap size estimator. Oh, and for the, uh, for the guy that wanted to know about the serving itself, like this is a pretty good example of, of a serving API. Um, the API for estimating the size captures uh, a SOAP key, this is a database key. And then it expects a query parameter named shower length, uh, which is going to be encodable and decodable from doubles. And there's another query parameter called budget. We're going to make a get request and we're going to get back a tuple of three doubles. Those are the dimensions of the SOAP. So there's nothing in this type about, are we talking about a server, a client, a front end, or anything, it's totally abstract. Or you know, another interpretation we can have for this type is documentation. You can render this into docs, and you know, that's another really cool servant you know, feature. And uh, here, the bigger API for the entire app is we've composed together, um, here you can see the estimation API, is composed together with a CRUD API and that color API that I briefly mentioned for getting the color of the pixel, or family of pixels. And uh, right, I'll, I'll, I won't dwell too much on the server side, but we um, here's a, a snap, snaplet in it uh, action that uses that server side API to serve you know, the API, sorry, a little redundant. And then uh, what does this look like on the front end? We have a reflex DOM interpretation of serving APIs that if you're familiar with how serving goes. Like for each one of these um, abstract combinators, there's an actual like uh, type that that kind of maps to in the domain that you're working in. So, uh, right, this bird face combinator, as Julian likes to call it, turns into function application. If you bird face together two APIs, you get a function that takes the left API as an input to the right API. 
the fish combinator turns into the alternative fish. This is type level fish turns into value level fish. And that's for alternativing together a pair of APIs. So this is how we alternative together both the fact that we have a color API and an estimator API and a credit API. Captures turn into something a little bit more complicated than they turn into in uh, serving client and serving server. Because we're in uh, reflex land, we and we're we're probably going to be working with um, with like widgets that build up uh, the types that are getting captured. We might not always have that thing in the timeline. Like at this instant in time, uh, the key might be invalid, it might be spelled wrong or empty or whatever. So we have to account for that fact in the um, in the interface that we build up for the API. So captures turn into dynamic T either text or case. And that that can always exist. You can always have a left if your A is not decodable as it is right now. Uh, query params turn into dynamic T qparam A. This is basically, qparam is basically either, but it has one extra constructor for saying, we don't have an A, but we don't care. This query parameter is optional. So if you, if you use the more like hard failing one, then that means you can't actually build a request and don't even bother sending it. So that's qparam. And the interpretation of get, this is kind of like the end of any particular API, is also totally different from serving client and serving server. Gets, posts, and puts turn into a function from event t unit to monadic event t rep result unit a. Uh, some of those things I'm going to skim over, like the, why are there the units there? Don't worry too much about it. Um, or look at the headlocks if you want to know about that. Um, but the main point here is that this final event T unit is a trigger event. Like this is the thing that says, okay, right now is the time to actually fire off an MTHR. And the return, uh, the return value events are sometime later the, the responses come back and they get decoded into an A. Decoding might not work. The server might be down or it might have given back some garbled data. So rec result is also a lot like either it can return a failure. So there's that. Okay, so um, unpacking that for our estimation API. The estimation API, to remind you, is you're capturing a oops, little typo. That's on the that's a key, so pretty much the same. And then we have our pair of query parameters. We're getting back a JSON encoded tuple of doubles. What that gets turned into, this function my estimate has the type dynamic t either text in so you would use what you learned from doug's talk to make a widget that gives you back an either text in in dynamic dynamic t qparam double dynamic t qparam double your trigger event which you might get from a widget that's attached to a button buttons give you sorry is that a question or stretch no. No. and then um that runs to monad and we get back an event with those rep results. And uh, we didn't have to write that function. Like this is the punchline of servant is those functions get generated for us from the type families. So all we had to do was pick a name for it. And if this if this API had some alternatives in it, it would be a little bit more complicated. We had to match on something that had a uh, fished together pair of, of endpoints. But the point is, uh, we now have this named function that we can use in our front end. We can just pass it these dynamics and this event, and we'll get back an event of the results, which doesn't sound great. But if you've actually handwritten XHR requests, then you might be kind of happy about this because that's kind of an error prone part of the process. Okay, so that's that. Uh, I told you about sharing types, sharing functions, and sharing servant. APIs, which are types, but there's a special types that achieve them in it, between the front end and the back end. And we did all that in order that we could dry out as much of the logic as humanly possible in our web apps and keep the back end in sync with the front end so that we don't have to spend bucks. All right, so uh, is it all like, you know, road, road, whatever, some super happy space? Not totally, there's still some ongoing work. And um, I'll just run down sort of the list here of like some things that you uh, 
uh, want to be prepared for if you go down this route. Um, the type errors would serve in, in real world applications are really, really hard to read. Um, uh, the CRUD and API that I briefly showed you is itself a type synonym that expands out into something with 10 or 12 combinators in it. And it, when you start putting together, like you, your, your domain probably has lots of types and you want a CRUD API for all of those. So you're talking about like hundreds of these combinators together in one massive type. And when you get the types wrong, which happens a lot because that's the point of serving is it's catching when you make errors. It's, cat, it's like at compile time catching errors where the behavior in the front end doesn't match that in, in the back end or whatever. Uh, the type error is just pages and pages long. So that can be hard to deal with. There's some ongoing work to fix this. Uh, check out servant API check package. Uh, I hope someone pings me if that's not the state of the art solution to this problem. Um, there, there are probably like other people working on that. Anyway, so it's sort of like a, an open question. How do we make these type errors easier to deal with? Uh, single page app routing is something that you really want to be able to do now modernly. And um, we don't have a great story for that yet, but we have a couple like interesting experimental things going on. So check out Reflex DOM Contrib. Uh, that's uh, sort of from us attacked. And there's also this project serve and render. Uh, which has an interesting serving base take on single page app routing. Uh, another thing that would be kind of cute if we could do is like we have generics in order to derive ASON representations for our data. Maybe we could use generics to get automatically derived reflex DOM forms too. Like there's enough information in a SOAP to tell you mechanically how to build a SOAP form. So it would be kind of cool if, if we didn't have to do those monadic actions to build them by hand. Um, Adam Connor Sachs is working on that kind of thing in Reflex Utils. I recommend you check that out. It's promising preliminary stuff, or maybe beyond that, I'm not really sure. Um, yes, uh, Servant Reflex itself has an API that's very focused on like dynamic parameters. You have like dynamic T, either text A in a lot of positions. And then a triggering event that says, like, actually fire off the XHR right now. Um, that's really useful sometimes, but it's pretty awkward other times. Like, sometimes you actually have a, a tuple of the A and B together that are already packaged up in an event, and you just want to send that off. If that's what you have in the front end, then you have to do some work to get that into my circuit reflex, uh, you know, sort of form. And that's kind of ugly. So. Something I've been working on and it's, it's actually evaded me for a while. It's like, how can I uh, get the type families to give me this sort of API in addition? Uh, if there's some like type type family wizards, I hope that has piqued your interest. That maybe you could help out there. Um, forking some of your code into a shared library and making that a dependency of both your back end and your front end can be a pain, especially if you're uh, the front end guy, and you're the only person who cares about having types and functions available in the front end. You have to convince the rest of your team that, hey, I'm going to disrupt your nice module structure and yank out all of the things that don't mention persistent into a whole separate package uh, just so that I can have some type level fun effectively. So that, that can be a bit of a strain since it can be like a hard sell. Um, there's like some tension there. If you have another scheme for organizing your modules, it's not nice to add a second constraint on top of that. So it's something that we've been maybe thinking about, I don't know if it's safe or what, is to use symlinks uh, between the modules to like kind of symlink in the, whatever subset of modules that are in your backend code, but are GHCJS safe, like maybe you could have like a symlinked common thing and, and then uh, you wouldn't have to consider that a whole separate cabal package and you know, deal with that separately. Um, don't really know if that's legitimate programming practice or not, um, but we might try it. I'm gonna try it. And lastly, uh, this is all really bleeding edge stuff. So uh, if you get reflex down from package, there's some things that are out of date, like dynamic T is not a functor there. You have to monadically do functor like stuff. Uh, more modern reflex DOM is a million times more convenient to work with. 
and uh, is also compatible with server reflex. There is no certain reflex that works on the hackish version of reflex DOM. So those are some pain points, but uh, having like worked with this, I don't mind those pain points at all because these tools are incredibly cool. Um, there's the stuff I've shown you, which would probably be cooler if I designed them a little bit so they like look nicer. Um, but there's a lot of stuff I didn't show you too. So like GHCJS DOM is an incredible tool. Like um, I almost got this demo working, but not quite. Um, you can compile your, your reflex DOM code with GHC and it type checks and you actually get an executable. You get a running desktop app out of that. Now, I don't want to oversell that too much uh, because like there's, you do have to do some work uh, in order to like bridge the impedance mismatch between the way that you normally write a web app and the way that you write a desktop app. Like you, you don't, have, you can't have like CSS files floating around that you just like link in. You have to inline those and stuff like that. But with a surprisingly small amount of work, you can just have a desktop app version of your web app. It's very cool. And uh, what I use that for all the time is, isn't the desktop app itself, but I just make use of the fact that um, GHC is able to compile my front end. So I can have GHC ID running all the time and just type checking me as I'm going about, you know, doing my front end business. Uh, that's really nice. So um, my claim is uh, writing the whole application in Haskell is practical, fun, and type safe. It really is a lot of fun. Um, I have a more fun talk, some like more fun demos. You can ask me after if you want to see some like, fun reflex on stuff. Um, if you want to get into this kind of thing, you can use soap.io or Doug Beardsley's H snippet project to see some examples of how to do this code sharing uh, in the large. If you have any questions, get in touch. I'm, I'm also Greg on uh, IRC and whatever email. And uh, come hang out in the Reflex FRP and serve an IRC channels. There's a, there are really active communities and there's like always like new stuff that people are coming up with. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's nice to, to uh, be involved in that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's my last slide. So I'll, I'll take any questions. And if anyone's curious about like seeing how uh, the actual code for that app works, uh, I'm happy to like, blow up my Emacs font size and we can actually like look through some stuff if you're interested. Yeah, thanks.
what's in your tables and when things get updated. Um, yeah, like, like maybe. Um, yeah. Any other questions before going into the weeks? Yeah, so um, what, would, what would you like to see uh, in front of First, let me just, first I'll demonstrate GHCIE. Here's a parser. And you can get feedback that quickly from, from changes you make in, in Unix. GHCIE is, is um, how I've been able to survive the transition to Mix, where I have not been smart enough to figure out how to get the rest of my tools back. I actually discovered I like GHCIE better than GHC mod, um, because I like seeing a list of the errors rather than having to navigate to them. Um, Shay Levy here is doing some work to get us uh, support for GHC mod inside a Nix shell, inside of Emacs. And I find that I like it even better to have both, um, but you know, that is still kind of in the works. All right, so um, let me show you valid input. Well, so here's the real life usage. Uh, I don't know if you remember like this kind of motif, NM. A ladder do. This is like slightly different from what I showed you in the slides, but um, but not really materially different. This is all type checks. That was just like decorative divs around those widgets. So uh, valid input uh, is being called three times to build those three fields in a new sort uh, form. And here's the implementation. Not too long. Uh, field name, first argument, uh, is not really important. This is the validating function that's more interesting. And then I have a pair of event T units. And um, one of them is for saying, I now care about actually validating fields. Like if you, if you have like a live updating like a red haze behind any field that's invalid, then it starts out with a red haze when it first pops up, which isn't nice. So there's, you have to do like a little, a little bit of like extra stuff to get the niceness in there. So these, um, this bump uh, argument is going to be used to say the user has tried to hit submit. Uh, so now start actually putting those red error things up when appropriate. Um, question, Eric? Yeah. Uh, a lot of topic by CSTs. Uh, are they ever used? Oh yeah, so we've been dancing around with T all day. Um, the T is a, a phantom type that um, that refers to the reflex timeline that we're talking about. So um, all of the monadic stuff that um, that smash together dynamics and events in order to give, give resulting ones. Um, they have to be pretty careful to make sure that they're actually like on the same timeline. Some implementation details that don't understand, blah, blah, blah. But if those T's unify, uh, if, if the type checker can prove that they're the same T, then you're guaranteed the glitch free uh, you know, combination of, of different Harpy objects. And um, I think that along the lines of what Hamish was asking, um, there's there's supposed to be some stuff we can do if we have multiple teams for multiple timelines. But I haven't seen examples of that to know exactly what that means or how you would use that. Something interesting. Oh, uh, yeah, question. What do I mean by multiple timelines? I'm, I'm going to plead the fit there to make sure I don't say anything wrong. No, I'm gonna, I'll try. I'll try to say something. Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, uh, I'll say if you if you don't mind going into the uh, Reflex FRP IRC channel and asking Ryan Trinkle, he can probably tell you like all sorts of interesting stuff about it. Um, I'm, I'm I'm gonna kind of make up wrong things if I try to explain it. I have a very hazy idea of what that's about. I'm sorry. Nothing to do with any world general. Many worlds general. 
Um, I haven't actually heard that floated around. Like if different people in the multi-use multiverse are have like compiled the same front end code, it's like that can tie together the different timelines. Uh, anyway, so some real here's some real world uh, reflex on code. Um, I'll start with like some not very interesting. How are we good time? Okay, I've got about ten minutes. Um, L adder is a function that takes the name of an HTML element and then uh, a map from attribute names to attribute values. Uh, equals colon is map dot singleton. So if there's only one attribute for this element, uh, it's or and then that's where we use the field name. So the, this is going to build a div in the page. Uh, not a div. It's going to build a label in the DOM of the page. And then the last argument is is like all of our children, all the all the child DOM of that element. So text input comes from reflex DOM and that builds a uh, text box. And then here we're setting uh, some attributes of the text box. That's a, the, um, the attributes field of uh, text input config is a dynamic map of attributes. And I'll show you where we're building up that dynamic map here. The input attributes, it starts from uh, this dynamic value called this error state. We're F mapping over it with this dotted function. If it's just, uh, we're ruling over that. So if it is just, then we're going to add a class to the attributes of that text input. If the error state is nothing, then we will not add that class. And then we're going to stick some more attributes in there unconditionally. So that's what builds up a dynamic map of attributes for that text input. So what is error state? Error state is where applicative being together with this pure function, function from EMP and TXT to if bump. If bump means we currently care about validation. Then uh, validate, oh yeah, validate is the validating function we passed it as an argument. Uh, txt, if, if it's left, I'm getting prism confused. If not bump, then we're not, what am I doing now? I'm getting mixed up. At any rate, um, oh, oh yeah, error state is just like using the prism to pull the left out of um, the result of the validate function. So we're calling validate on text. That's either a text or an, a valid A. Uh, and if it's left, then we have just the text. If it's right, then we have nothing. So the error state is maybe text. And then we're using it down here to build up our attribute list. And that's that's a pretty good representation of like what you're doing with reflex DOM. So you're like you're just piecing together these dynamic things to build attribute lists out of other dynamic values and then plugging them onto parts of the DOM. Is that kind of making sense? Uh, sort of. Yeah, this stuff can take a long time to, to soak in. So if you just want to like spend some time, I'm totally happy to like help you write something, which is a lot more educational than listen to me standard through uh, Eric. <laughs> um, I, I personally don't, and I don't remember how, but I know that it is done. Um, yeah, so there's there's like a pure implementation of the reflex like runtime, and uh, I've seen someone do that kind of thing where instead of events being kind of nebulous, like you can you can supply a list of events as an input and then expect a list of events as an as an output. And you can test that kind of thing. Um, I generally don't do that kind of testing. Uh, it's, it's so researchy and it's hard for me to think about. Yeah. Is there any uh, any other part of code that anyone wanted to see in the last last minutes here? Maybe just interesting to see a, a more complex thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is actually. Okay.
Yeah, all right. Thanks. Thanks a whole lot. Everyone.